So what we hope to do in this presentation is to share some of our pictures from the data collection and perhaps talk through those pictures with some kind of analytic commentary. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the context of the Cyan and Muslim population in China, but there are experts here who've written extensively on that, and I actually draw from their work in my understanding of that context. Uh, we also brought some fieldwork artifacts for you. I try to do this sometimes in research seminars so you get a feel for the kinds of re uh, things that we looked at in the research. Uh, these are an artist's portfolio, a scroll, which we will talk about, paper cutting, and also some literacy artifacts that you can look at and touch and perhaps read. <clears throat> um, so our interest in the... I also want to apologise for my slightly croaky voice, which just started this morning. So I will speak uh, slight, a slightly lower volume than normal. Uh, so my, our interest in the heritage literacy of this community stems from the idea that although both the Islamic and the Chinese civilizations appear to be very distinct and with their own propensities to grow and perhaps assimilate others, a close sociolinguistic ex examination reveals a rich tapestry of uh, simultaneity and mutual, uh, uh, mutuality. Uh, what kinds of semiotic phenomena might one discover uh, in, such, in a place where both have co-converged over a prolonged period, well, that's exactly what we set out to discover and set out to, better, to try to better understand. Uh, so the, the work is funded by the Leverhulme Trust, but I've recently uh, won another grant from the British Academy for a similar study in Hong Kong, which, of course, is a completely different linguistic landscape uh, encompassing Indonesian, Urdu, English as an international lingua franca, Arabic as a theological lingua franca, Indonesian as another lingua franca, and of course Mandarin and Putonghua uh, and Cantonese, multiple lingua francos, each competing for space in small spaces like mosques in Hong Kong. But that's, maybe I can come back next year to talk about that project. The art, if, if, you, if you like the project and if you're interested. So the art here is from a, 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 a uh, Ma'adalong Laosha, who's a friend of ours, a friend of the project, and uh, it, it, I think that, that many of our participants in the research saw themselves as being part of two worlds at the same time, and I think that this picture embodies that kind of simultaneity, the letter Ba, in some forms of uh, ilmul huruf, the knowledge of letters, you will hear people talking about the Ba, because the Ba is the first letter of Bismillah rahman rahim which is the opening there's a theological difference about if, if, if it's a part of the Qur'an or if it's used as an opener for every, for every chapter, but it's the letter bar, and the dot of the bar is what makes it recognisable, and so all the meaning of it is contained in the dot of the bar. And I think this is what, this is what the Chinese fisherman is searching for in this picture. At least that's my interpretation. I don't know. Everybody looks at art differently. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the elements of today's content come from work already published, work currently about to be published, and work that is being written. So feel free to follow the project and uh, learn more about it. Every time we talk about this, we add in new elements as the data is very complicated and it takes a long time to go through it. So you're seeing things for the first time here that we haven't sh uh, you know, shared with others. We'd like to acknowledge the excellent work of our team. Bo Wan, sitting over here, is one of our researchers, of course. Um, we needed to have a team so that we could get a, pay attention to the local or vernacular aspects of heritage literacy, which differ according to dialect, region, etc. It takes a few people to handle data. Uh, it's really difficult to handle data uh, because of multiple dialect features and things like this. And of course, during the pandemic, we had to be geographically dispersed due to various lockdown measures across various cities in the UK and in China. The researchers in various ways have different connections to the Sino-Muslim community, either by fa faith tradition or family connection. This is important for the studies quote, religious positionality, unquote, somewhat of a thorny subject in uh, Western social science, where it is often deemed as better if you are detached from the community you are researching. Uh, for us, however, being quasi-insiders led to more empathetic encounters with research participants, deeper engagements, and uh, a, a kind of religious positionality that we were able to 
harness and develop through an auto-ethnographic component to the research. And I'm a big fan of that kind of thing. It also helped with participant recruitment, uh, which of course, and there's a debate about inside and outside, and there's pros and cons to both. It all depends on the project you're doing and what the aims of your project are. Uh, the, the field benefits from multiple perspectives. Uh, so this is what we'll try to cover, hopefully, in the next 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes. Uh, the research requires some discussion of context, but I won't delve on it too much, uh, because I want to get into the, we want to get into the meat of it, the data, and show you lots of it as much as we can. But a couple of concepts might be useful to hold on to. Simultaneity, covert semiosis, and creative adaptations. So one of the difficult things about presenting on this research is the amount of time we think we need to talk about the context. Uh, so I'm going to skirt over it quickly uh, because that can always be talked about at another time or uh, you can read the work of our, our work or the work of other people. So Muslims have lived in China since the 7th century or 8th centuries depending on where you get your history from. Uh, but most Chinese minority groups have their own heritage languages which are catered for to varying degrees in national policies. Ethnic and Chinese-speaking Muslims, that is to say Sinophone Muslims or Sino-Muslims, do not have their own separate language within which they can ring fence and protect their heritage. Uh, but they do have a range of what we would call heritage literacy practices, which the community has maintained for, for centuries, and which are central to community-based ways of knowing and being. Without a heritage language within which they can ring fence and protect their heritage, their heritage literacy practices end up being multi-semiotic, multimodal, multilingual, and thus very sociolinguistically interesting for us. Uh, we therefore frame our interest in this topic as heritage literacy, and we think this gives us a suitable and flexible from theoretical and methodological framework when, to make sense of these practices. Um, since the founding of the People's Republic, religious distinctions fell under the category of minzu, ethnic minority, and regulated by state-run institutions. Uh, practices under the aegis of minzu heritage are sometimes the only outlet for public religious expression, including heritage literacies associated with Chinese Islamic calligraphy, public prayers at funerals and marriages, though you won't find public prayers at any other time usually, uh, on Eid you will, uh, and promotion of Muslim quote-unquote Muslim cuisine, Qingzhen Xie Ping. So our analysis of heritage literacy and its multi-semiotic forms has tended to attach itself to these things. Uh, well, the methods are, we, you know, we, it's an ethnographic commitment to heritage literacy uh, from the ground up, so to speak. So participants are recruited from a, a number of different provinces, you can see on the slide, including uh, also in Hong Kong, SAR, <coughs> and even we engage with the people in the diaspora, the UK, Indonesia, Middle East, and the US, as well as other places, Turkey. Uh, so the scope is quite wide. Multi-sided and, and a multi-pronged approach was needed. Some interviews were intergenerational, with more than one generation present. Those were fun. Uh, others were narrative biographical, where people talked about their history of engagement with heritage in their life. And some of these were the go-along interviews, a method we take from the field of geography studies, where you walk along a particular area in a particular area with your respondent. Uh, in particular locations like Jingzhen Xiang, Halal Lane, or the area around that, the Chengdong district. Other, me other methods include the collection of literacy artifacts, observation of key heritage literacy events, and linguistic landscaping. A lot of pictures, some 2,000 of them. We're still working through them. 80 odd interviews, and of course, the auto ethnographic component. What matters is the sign system. In, a linguistic, in this kind of linguistic study. So if they, you have the book in the top right, which is a book of Islamic belief. I've copied it for you to look at here on the table. And then you have the street sign, Halal Lane, Qingzhen Xiang. And so one, perhaps one strand of analysis is how the linguistic features of home-based, text-based li uh, literacy, li home-based literacy practices find their way into the linguistic landscape of 
the public place. Uh, that's one strand of analysis. Uh, our focus is on the everyday, the vernacular, the mundane, the quotidian practices of heritage literacy. Perhaps we could say in Chinese terms at the level of minjian, people to people practices. So not necessarily a top down notion of what is quote literacy with a uppercase L, uh, be it from an Islamic, centralized Islamic understanding or a centralized top down sort of Han centric Mandarin perspective, but really literacies with a small L and a plural at the level of the everyday. I just want to make that clear. People sometimes think that if you're doing literacy studies, you're measuring how good people are at reading and writing. That is precisely not what we are looking at. Oh, I'm doing this one, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> right, so our first uh, section of analysis is heritage, literacy, and art. Here you see uh, God is great, Allahu Akbar, rendered into a uh, dragon motif and a lotus flower alongside it. Uh, by a, uh, uh, an artist from Linxia, Hui Autonomous Prefecture, South Gansu, uh, who's also a friend of our project. We have his entire portfolio. He's allowed us to show it to you, uh, and you can look at his work. So, Sini calligraphy, or Sino-Islamic calligraphy, or Sini calligraphy. It's a syncretic approach that aesthetically integrates Islamic art and Chinese calligraphic traditions. Oh, sorry. There you go. Uh, historically, Sino-Muslims employed this kind of calligraphy as a way to show assimilation between Chinese aesthetics and Islamic scriptural art. A remarkable feature of this is the harmonious merger of two apparently incommensurate scripts, Chinese and Arabic uh, scripture. Sini calligraphy incorporates elements of Chinese material culture as well. Uh, as the Sini script evolved, Chinese calligraphers in, Chi in, 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 in Arabic calligraphers in China would use the, the brush as well as the pen. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it strengthened the, China, the Sino Muslim community's claim to indigenousness and intangible cultural heritage, which lasts till today. Examples of this can be seen in works of, of, by artists such as Mi Guanjiang or ha, uh, Haji Nuruddin, whose work is actually displayed in the Manchester Museum across the road. Uh, and his is the square character format. It's the declaration of faith on the screen on the left with the square character format. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and you see the square character format uh, outside many mosques, including the Xi'an Great Mosque, Grand Mosque, as you, as you can see on the left of the slide there. On the right, you have uh, what some people call jing sehua, or what we translate as scriptural painting. Uh, and that is from the artist uh, who did the dragon motif, and his work is over there. So in both cases, there is a, there is a form of what linguistic anthropologists call entextualization. Uh, that is to say, discourse features are extracted from one place, Chinese aesthetics, in some cases Chinese philosophy, and inserted into a new context elsewhere for a new audience with a new framing uh, uh, and, and with a new purpose in mind. Um, so <clears throat> this is um, the square character form again uh, at the Xi'an Great Mosque, one of the halls there. I decided to zoom in. Uh, I wanted to ask anybody, does anybody know what it says? Can anybody read it? I'll give you five seconds and I'll give you a free copy of my book if you can read it. Bye. <laughs> Four. Okay, well, it says that. It's very hard to read, by the way. Uh, so that, that's the you know, prayers upon the prophet. Uh, and it's, each one is, the top part's the same, the bottom part is slightly different because it's using a different appellation of the prophet Muhammad. And it's, uh, so it's, it's all, it's all across the Xi'an Great Mosque like that. So, in textualization. As I, as I noticed in textualization, I wanted to get to know what it looks like, how people do it. So I asked people, both calligraphy masters and students in the research we both did. And um, it's very organic, it's very individualized. There's no one rule, set of rules through which Chinese aesthetics and philosophical principles are moved into uh, Islamic art. So here, teacher Li says uh, that, that he expresses Chinese philosophy and aesthetics he performatively integrates them into his brushwork. He says we express yin yang in the work itself. Uh, and he talks about the difference between uh, his work and the work of Arabic calligraphy written by the Arabs. 
And textualization refers to the process of taking a stretch of language, a unit or principle or some sort of discourse, out of its original setting, recontextualizing it, translating it or adapting it into a new context for a new audience and for a new purpose and framing. It's not extraction with perfect fidelity. It never is. There are changes along the way. But it is performative and syncretic and, in, and contains intertextual elements as we saw in the previous slide. So scenic calligraphy contains a lot of these intextualizing features, which may vary from one person to the next. So it's a very individualized uh, um, process. The balance between uh, black and white, the weight of the characters, the rhythm of the lines, all of these are talked about by Teacher Lee here. Teacher Han says that the farther east you go into the areas from where, quote, the Han culture originated, that you will see more intense forms of intextualization. Uh, perhaps this also speaks to sinusization as intextualization. That's something to think about. Uh, Baoji is new to the Islamic faith. She's a Han Chinese, Chinese Muslim. Uh, and for her, scenic calligraphy is an ideal way to her, for her to converge to uh, two types of, quote, civilization in her life. And this word came a lot in the data, civilization, civilization. Uh, um, we see a lot of references to it. She's able to, through scenic calligraphy, she is able to uh, integrate her Chinese past and present with her Islamic past and future, present and future, without belaboring the disjunctions between the two. Uh, as a recent Sino-Muslim, though not Hui, she feels she is a carrier of Sino-Muslim heritage and must embody these two things within herself. Scenic calligraphy allows her to do it. It is thus a site for simultaneity. And there's a mihrab, meaning the front part of a mosque where the imam stands, uh, of a mosque in the Henan province where the, quote, Han culture originated, according to teacher Han. Himself is called teacher Han, by the way. So how do Sini calligraphers do this online? This is one of the things we looked at. Uh, we, they strategically deployed social media and other digital tools, particularly since the pandemic, in order to maintain connection with their students. Uh, in this post, Teacher Lee, uh, he presents a calligraphic rendition of a brief poem by the 8th century Islamic theologian, Ash-Shafi'i. The original poem mentions, and you have Islam and general wellness in Arabic, afia. It's a difficult word to translate, but it could be translated as general wellness, uh, which Teacher Lee renders into Jalman, teachings. Uh, of course, it can mean religion, but it can mean Taoism and Buddhism if you look it up on Baidu. So when I asked him about that, he said, that's the best word to use online. Uh, and uh, he justified it for the online purpose. Uh, and he said people wouldn't notice, people would understand what is being said. He feels he should tread carefully due to the platform's regulations about religious activity, Weixin, uh, WeChat, if you don't know, uh, and religious words to, that are used on the platforms, particularly political words. Uh, uh, the are oft, posts are often removed that use those words or that posts that are deemed to be proselytizing. And the platform's AI keyword censoring system picks up on these apparently. So he, would, so he also posted a post alongside this image, uh, po pointing, again, pointing once again to the re-rendering of the image from a calligraphic work of art, intangible cultural heritage gets a green light, uh, but exegesis of it uh, requires a certain kind of, uh, you know, tiptoeing of a red line, and so he argue, uh, so, so here we see another kind of intextualization, which is slightly more strategic uh, uh, for one's audience, and uh, one has to consider one's audience and an AI-based censoring system that is largely keyword-based. So here, so from a linguistic perspective, we don't just look at the, we're not just looking at the piece of art, we're looking at its exegesis. Uh, and its translation uh, and the multiple intextualizing features. So um, exegesis is a fundamental part of scenic calligraphy. Traditionally, this was done in a mosque or perhaps anywhere else. When masters taught how to write sacred art, they also taught its deeper meanings. It comes with it. It's part of the program. 
uh, but our online people have to do this slightly differently. In only working with the first end textualization, remember it's already in textualized because it's scenic calligraphy, uh, the handcrafted work of, of art, the analysis is not complete because it must require an exegesis. Uh, and so now you have an AI-based censoring system to contend with as part of sensitive word culture. And so I, uh, for, for this reason, I, uh, we argue that scene calligraphy takes place within a post-digital literacy ecology. I don't have time to go into what that means, but I've written a couple of articles. I was told this was going to happen, but it doesn't matter because I prepared mentally for it. I've, uh, a couple of post-digital, this happened in my job interview as well, by the way. And I was totally cool as a cucumber. Uh, a post-digital literacy ecology. Uh, which means that a, that a calligrapher is not just dealing with the past, they're also dealing with the present. They're all they're dealing with the future of their work as their post is maintained and spread around, but shared by different people. They're also integrating humans, but also a non-human uh, 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 sort of um, AI-based censoring system. So there's like socio-material theory to, to consider here. The act of, there are lots of things impinging upon the literacy activity, human, non-human, present and non-present, past and future. So uh, I try to talk about this as a, it's part of the platformization of heritage literacy. And this is a class that we observed, an online class. I wonder if I click it, it will play. Yes, it does. And so here we're integrating, he's, we see the integration of a very, very hands-on tactile art in the digital realm as he's teaching. In, on this particular occasion with a pen, but you will also see the brush used. Uh, 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 through for his online followers. And we spent an extensive amount of time with this particular teacher to learn how he operates. <coughs> so, such practices are part of what we would call covert semiosis, which, are, which we argue has a history, a practice that has a history. So to explain this, let me show you a shop sign belonging to Farid, which is actually the sign and size version of the Arabic name Farid. But look at how it is written. You can see the crescent. You can see, if you read Arabic, can you see the lam and the alif and the ha if you turn your head to the side slightly? So you see the letters for the word halal in Arabic, uh, in areas where Arabic signage is no longer allowed. Uh, so these are a number of what I would call covert. You see the shoehorning of Arabic. And there's a lot of shoehorning, but it's quite cleverly done, not in a crude way, what I call covert semiosis. It has a history in scripture-related signage, or signage that is inspired by heritage literacy. This practice, of course, occurs within art. That's where it came from, uh, including in the Jing Suha I showed you earlier. Um, but that'll have to be a talk for another day. The middle image, sorry, the image on the right is from uh, Ma Jun, who also did the, uh, the, the uh, paper cuttings here, and you can see uh, the, tr the simplified character for longevity, show. And, but if you turn your head up to the side, it reads salam in Arabic, so it's saying two things at once. Okay, here's another opportunity for you to get a free copy of my book. What does the middle image say? Anybody know? Anybody want to? What is it? It's really hard. Okay, it's tough. Uh, I thought I'd give op options if anybody... Right, so five seconds, five, four, three, two, one. Actually, it's the 99 names of God uh, written in Arabic, but each, each one, well, there's some of the 99 names. There are several pillars in the Xi'an Great Mosque, but they're all inspired by the traditional character, Sho, the traditional version of the character, right? I mean, this is really clever art. It's really intelligent stuff, right? And they don't even know the name of the person who did this. He did it, and then he died, and then his style died with him. And this is what I mean by the organic and individualized nature of how Chineseness is intextualized in uh, uh, Islamic art, and how Islam is intextualized into, or Muslimness is intextualized in Chinese art. So I argue that covert semiosis has a history. Okay, so we went to the um, Mosque, which is about 30 miles outside of Xining. It's not very far from the airport in Xining. If you, if you ever visit there and you've got a few hours, pay a visit. It's hard to get to. You've got to go up a few country lanes and hills, but it's really nice. It's actually one of the most well-preserved, beautiful mosques I've ever seen in my life. So here you can see a, a, a mosque from, I think it's early Ming Dynasty. Uh, and uh, the, during the Cultural Revolution, 
uh, Arabic was engraved on the walls, like these walls here, which are, which are wooden. And the, it, it was rubbed off, it was pulled off. And you can see it pulled off, like half pulled off. Right? And they've left it there, which I think is a really good thing to do. Just leave things that, as they are. But then I saw other Arabic engravings that were left. So I said, why are the other ones left? They said the Red Guards didn't think that they were Arabic. They thought that they were just patterns. And so this made me think that covert semiosis has a history. A way to seem non-threatening with heritage literacy. A way, to seem, a way to send the message out in a way that it is noticed by the right people, but not by the, the wrong people, if you know what I mean. And, uh, and so they were left, and I thought that was quite interesting. I like the way they left everything intact in this place, including the Red Guards graffiti on the wall, uh, uh, which uh, it, you can, uh, it's, it, it's difficult to read, but it's basically a, 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 a around, the time, around that time. There were several sort of mantras that were you know, uh, uh, repeated uh, as part of that process. So for, oh, ah, okay, here we go. So scenic calligraphy derives its meaning from uh, its symbolic qualities being closely related to scripture, or in Chinese terms, Jing. Uh, tr trying to further understand this uh, and its symbolic weight, we turn to people's underlying assumptions about what signs these signs mean to them in their lives, what these calligraphic artifacts mean to them, and what pur purported consequences they might bring. Ultimately, this stems from a metalinguistic connection to Perso-Arabic script, uh, or semiotic ideologies, if you take it from Webb Keen, the anthropologist. Uh, for some, it's based on its hermeneutic quality, that is to say, their ability to read the script. For many others, it's based on its emblematic quality, that is to say, they attach visual significance to it. And you find with many non-Arab Muslims, uh, they attach uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, significance to the visualization or the emblematic quality of Perso-Arabic script. Uh, ar thus, Arabic as Jing, even when sinicized, operates as a valorized indexical for sacredness. Uh, the term Jing also becomes a semiotic device and attaches itself onto other words, like Jingming, scripture name. The name comes from the scripture, and it's a kind of uh, attaching it to the heritage. It's a heritage literacy activity, which I'll come to later, actually. More practically, respondents revealed semiotic ideologies in various forms. Mei Li says that uh, she thought everything was Qingzhen when she was in Xinjiang, uh, because everything had Arabic on it. Then she went to the toilets of the restaurant and said, so, well, that's got Arabic writing on. Then she realized it's not Arabic, it's Uyghur, it's the Uyghur language, which is in Perso-Arabic script. Uh, um, and then she realized she can't tell the difference. Slightly embarrassing, but actually, this is very common for people who don't engage with heritage literacy outside of heritage spheres. Those who do, like, like Lay, says that my friend didn't like the fact that I, was ha that I had an Arabic language textbook uh, and I was throwing it around the room, putting it on the floor. And his friend said, don't do that. That's Jing. That's the scripture. He said, no, it's not Jing. I wouldn't treat Jing that way. This is just an Arabic language textbook. So the symbolic weight of Jing also applies to how people deal with calligraphy. So we ask people, where do you put the calligraphy? Why do you put it there? Uh, just a simple question, but we got some very interesting answers. We, took, we asked people to take pictures of the artifacts in the house and where they're placed. Uh, and some of them say that they serve to differentiate. We put this here because we show that this is a Muslim house. On the outside, if you can still do that, uh, uh, but on the inside, definitely, in the main room of the house, that we are Hui, and this is a Sino-Muslim house. Uh, others would say that it's a, a advertised proof that we're from a Chinese Muslim family. And then Mike from Gansu says that we put them in the rooms when our grandfather had a period of difficulty. So to serve to, protect, to, to, serve to differentiate, to serve to remind, to serve to protect. Semiotic ideologies associated with scenic calligraphy as emblematic sort of artifact change with time and, of course, uh, you know, per person's own uh, 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 knowledge. By the way, we use pseudonyms for the participants, but we use pseudonyms that reflect their semiotic ideology about their own self-naming. So if they call themselves with a regular Han Chinese name, we give them a regular Han Chinese pseudonym. If they call themselves by a Western name, we call them by a 
a sort of Anglo name, that is to say, we call them by an Anglo name, like Mike. And if they use an Arabic name to, to, to refer to themselves, like Musa or something, well, then we call them so, by a similar pseudonym. So we wanted to represent their semiotic ideology even in their self-naming uh, as we report on their research, uh, through this research. How people feel about Arabic words also links closely to, this, to the decisions that they make about which words to use in different religious activities and with whom they will use them. In these cases, semiotic ideologies are not so Arabic-oriented. For participants who have networks outside of China, the localized, that is to say Sinicized, and in some kind, sometimes Persian origin, where names of everyday forms of worship are preferred. These have given way, sorry, to more popular Arabized uh, terms used with everyday interactions with foreigners. Hechen, who's originally from Qinghai, and then moved to Beijing and then to the US, says that he used to use his own Persianized uh, Qinghai dialect words to describe prayers. And then when he went to Beijing, he used uh, some uh, more Arabic terms. And he's recently taken a decision to use the more sort of local terms. And the names for prayers actually sound different. Sham is evening, or the sunset prayer, which has just gone. And Sham in Arabic means the Levant. It's going to be quite confusing if you're praying Sham, <laughs> and they think that you're praying to the Levant or something. Jim Bao's account is interesting. He says, that he, uh, he says that when talking about prayer, we use the Mandarin word <laughs> li bai, rather than namaz, which is the local Persian origin dialect word. For wudu, that is to say the water cleansing before prayer, he would use uh, the Mandarin term xiao jing, uh, 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 or, or, or sometimes he would use the Mandarin, the Ningxia dialect word, a bu dai zi. forgive me if I mispronounce things, um, uh, which is from the Persian abdest, meaning wudu. But once with a foreign Muslim friend he just met, uh, they didn't understand any of those words. So he used what I would describe as the idiom of gesture. And he decided to show what he, those things were, uh, to wash his face and hands. And, and, and that's really important. The bodily performance uh, becomes the sacred idiom upon which their semiotic ideologies converge. And of course, in the semiotics of Muslimness, or indeed the semiotics of any religion, the idiom of gesture is very, very important. It is sometimes uh, done, it is sometimes the most powerful form of communication or semiosis. <laughs> uh, we will come back to the sem sem idiom of gesture shortly. Han, you want to? Okay, so um, this kind of tension, if you call it that, or the semiotic decision making has also taken place over the centuries with respect to the noman, uh, divine nomenclatures. I Meaning when uh, Sino Muslims talk about Allah, the God, and the Prophet, etc., and uh, here you can see the word Allah actually is the literate uh, rated form um, from the Arabic word Allah. And uh, uh, we also use the word Jenju, the true Lord, which um, many <coughs> Chinese Muslims use in the historical works. Uh, and uh, this tells us that how Sino Muslims talk about <coughs> the God is something to observe in their everyday practices and open to variation in different contexts, just as um, our uh, uh, participants talk about their prayers. And also, um, the word used for the prophet varies um, with some the use of uh, different um, Chinese terms. Some use sheng ren, some use uh, xian zhi, some, of, some use qin sheng. They all vary uh, among different people. And the, uh, here we come to the uh, artwork, paper cutting. Everyday heritage literacy practices can also be said to can constitute a form of placemaking. The heritage literacy attached to art heritage in specific sites, such as the word of the teacher um, Ma Jun uh, Lao Shi, who is a paper cutter in Gansu province and uh, creates many pieces of features with his native Gansu province. And here in, in the left part of um, uh, the slide, you can see the paper card in blue. Uh, you can see the, uh, a, a person with white height pulling noodles. Uh, and uh, the Lanzhou University on the left part, 
the Landro Marathon, Landro Beef Noodles, etc. So this um, paper cut semiotically translate, translates the province and the Chinese identity and the Sino-Muslim identity as existing in the singular site. And on the right side, Mudan, uh, which is a, a symbolic flower in Gansu province. And uh, um, you can also see the Quran verse in the middle of the uh, artwork. And here are some other uh, artworks, paper cutting from teacher Ma Jun. And here he used the Chinese toys um, uh, skills to do the paper cutting, he said that the blank part, the white part, is the yang part, and uh, the paper cutting part is the yin part. So he used the toys term yin and yang uh, to do his paper cutting work. And now here we also observe some uh, martial art in our field work. So this um, plate, yes. Okay, so among the martial art uh, styles discussed in our research, uh, Cha Quan and Hui, uh, Hui Quan Qi Shi or Hui Zu Qi Shi Quan uh, were particularly notable as they hold signif uh, significant uh, uh, reverence within the Hui martial art uh, uh, community. And uh, we attended some of the Muslim martial art sessions publicly in the city squares and discuss their relevance for our research. Uh, for example, Jin Bao in the slide earlier mentioned about the wudu position is how, how it relates to the martial art positions uh, and the movements after um, the water cleanse. And also here, the semiotic mobility. Uh, we have the uh, Tang Ping style, which is also the Hui Zu Qi Shi Quan style. It's uh, based on the uh, picture which we use <coughs> to clean ourselves. And uh, actually this master in the top left, he's doing the uh, style of uh, picture, Tang Ping style. And uh, uh, the participant uh, who I'm, whom I talked to particularly mentioned that uh, you have to point your fingers up. This is the particular um, style of uh, uh, this uh, Hui Zu Qi Shi Quan. If it's not pointing up, it is not a particular one. And uh, now we come to the food part, which I don't like to talk every time because I can't get this here in this country. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes. So on the left part, it is a um, picture that we took from uh, Muslim Square in Xi'an city in uh, Shanxi province. And the right part <coughs> is from uh, Qinghai province, Xinin city. And both of these parts are Qingzhen uh, Square, Qingzhen Lane, meaning the Muslim uh, quarter. On the left picture, it is very um, popular place all over China. People go there to enjoy the Muslim food. And you don't need to ask if the food there is halal or not. You, you went there, you immediately can uh, experience the phenomena of this area because you can see the difference uh, between the outside this area as soon as you enter this area. And when you exit this area, you can notice a difference as well. And uh, uh, also, uh, these uh, quarters were well reserved from um, Song Dynasty, some buildings were from, still from Song Dynasty. And the right part <coughs> of the slide is less popular uh, than the left part, but also is the same phenomenon. That's the uh, word Qingzhen meaning halal. <coughs> and, uh, Does it mean it? <coughs> okay, so uh, the term Qingzhen, uh, is often used synonymously with the word halal or Islamic or Muslim uh, and it's a kind of metonymic stand-in for anything related to hal halalness, Muslimness or Islamicness. Uh, it doesn't really mean any of those things directly. Um, <coughs> so um, so the, I don't know if you've seen the animation 30,000 Miles from Chang'an, it's a new Chinese animation. It's a really good, nice little film. Uh, so it's about the Tang Dynasty poet Li Bai. 
uh, and Li Bai was one of the first people, if not the first, to use the term Qingzhen in one of his poems. And at some point along the way, Muslims thought that that would be a nice word to describe them or their religion. Uh, we don't, it's difficult to really trace that meaning. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's, there's a poem that was allegedly written by the first Ming emperor. There's a historical debate about whether he wrote it or not. But there's a poem. Uh, and he uses the term Qingzhen there to talk about Muslims as followers of Qingzhen Jiao, which means pure and true teachings. Mosque is called Qingzhen Se. Uh, I believe the ancient synagogue in Henan province might also be called Qingzhen Se as well, but I'm not sure. Perhaps uh, experts can, can clarify. In any case, Qingzhen is a, is a semiotic device to pay attention to. Qingzhen, I call it Qingzhen ethics in the book. Uh, the Tangping also relates to Qingzhen ethics because it's used for <coughs> cleanliness, okay? Pure and true, pure and clean. Uh, and it's semiotically transposed into a Kung Fu style uh, and it's become a visual stand-in for Muslimness. Uh, uh, and also, uh, um, so the term Qingzhen is, 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 is what's used in, in some places, in many places. It's one to pay attention to. So here, there you go. Uh, let, let's look at some shop signs now. So you see some of the translingual. Trans means to move across. So we, in linguistics, we use the term translingual or translanguaging to talk about how that movement is done. Because let's face it, most of us, when we're left alone, we don't respect the boundaries of language. We use emojis and we use multiple scripts and we drop in all sorts of different things. And people, in a sort of everyday sense, are translingual. And there's a whole literature on that in linguistics if you're interested. So you, here, here you see. Uh, um, let's start with the title of the shop, Mu uh, Ba La Ke, which uh, sounds like it's not even a group of Chinese words at all. Actually, it equates to one singular word, Mubarak, in Perso Arabic, uh, which means blessed, uh, a global Islamic word which originates from Arabic and popular throughout Asia, but depicted in the sign through regular Chinese characters. Uh, so here we can see translingual aspects and repertoire-based messaging. So repertoire-based messaging means you use everything in your repertoire to communicate to people, to index something far beyond China, far beyond Muslim street or the Muslim quarter, and into a deeper and wider sociolinguistics of Islam. How do I know? Because I knew exactly what it meant when I saw it. But in several linguistics lectures I gave in China, to Ch in Chinese universities, my mostly Han Chinese students did not know what it meant. They just said it's the local Hui community's dialect. And of course it is the dialect, but how do you define dialect anyway? It's, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's a wider sort of sociolinguistics of Islam that, that is at play here, and a very sort of important uh, indexical uh, connection to uh, sacredness, blessed to be blessed. By whom? By God, of course. It is emblematic. On the one hand, the official language is deployed through recognizable legal Chinese characters, but also bearing connections with another rather distant language of religious heritage, the Perso-Arabic term Mubarak. It's not motivated by linguistic meaning, because the Mubarak could, could amount to being meaningless to, to anyone who doesn't understand it. Uh, instead, it is laden with heritage sentiments. About a year or so before fieldwork, a year or two, uh, Arabic signage was removed, but you can see its ghostly presence. Can you see its ghostly presence on the left-hand side? I'll get back to the ghostly Arabic shortly. But the restaurant on the right is actually a new restaurant. Uh, we went to a lot of restaurants. I actually put a lot of weight in this uh, project, by the way. Uh, the restaurant on the right is a new restaurant, and that sign, Islamic ha China and Halal, Islamic food, etc., is on every wall, interior and exterior, on every table, on every menu and on every cutlery holder, lest you are in any doubt about the halalness of the cutlery. The point I'm making is that is Muslimness and halalness are there, even if Arabic isn't in many places, with respect to food, because perhaps because food is one of the places where it can flourish. Um, so let's look further at the trope of Qingzhou, or some of the signage. So here you have in Hanzhou, now we're going to the far east. So we've gone from northwest to the northeast to the far east. Hanzhou, you have, look at the ghostly Arabic. Uh, the Arabic for, the, for Islamic restaurant, Al Mat'am Al Islami, is still visible. Uh, it's been removed, and northwestern people has been used in its place. 
Arabic is discernible, but now stands as a remnant of a prior text juxtaposed with new category equivalents that were used in the revised sign. So the category equivalents here being that Islam becomes Northwestern people. I will come back to that as well. Uh, I have so many of the ghostly Arabic, I could literally do st go with an hour for an hour, just go through them all. Uh, so here you see public spaces are like palimpsests, with writing rubbed out and done again. Heritage or literacy itself is contingent on the repeated rubbing out and ad adapting. Repeated rubbing out and adapting again and again. That is one of the theoretical sort of takeaways from this research. And you do this one, don't you? Yeah, okay, so it is very interesting to observe some of the uh, divine nomenclature on the street. So here on the, um, yes, the left top, uh, sorry, uh, left bottom one in the uh, green signs, um, the one that was underlined, Ersa, is actually the Chinese people used to describe Jesus. And the Chinese Christian uh, used uh, Yesu to describe Jesus. So you can see how different Chinese people uh, adopted different words from different scriptures in their history. And the uh, top left one is Hashimu, which is the Arabic word uh, name Hashim, used in the Chinese characters. And uh, uh, <coughs> the yellow one, which is Isaha, is Isaac in, in, in Arabic and English. So these words uh, the Chinese sign are mostly used are based on the, the uh, pronunciations and the Chinese words they use in these names are not fixed. You can literally get the same pronunciation uh, characters put in these names and they mean the same person. So inside restaurants, uh, there are often multiple forms of narratives attached to Hui history and Muslimness. Uh, sometimes a little bit, they look like they're a little bit tokenistic and exoticized, but actually taken quite seriously uh, by people. So while Arabic halal signs are rubbed off, uh, there's a lot of Muslimness depicted in other forms, especially in food, as I said. These are different restaurants. You can see the crescent, the camel, domes, and quote, traditional, unqu traditional quote, clothes, unquote, and narratives about local Muslim origins. <laughs> Jingjian ethics here rela relates to a deep-rooted sense of tradition steeped in local heritage. Note that the Chinese text in the Qinghai yogurt is presented in a traditional manner, running from right to left, reminiscent of ancient times. This is actually one of my favorite ones. This is in Shanghai. It's a, it's a huge panel display engraved into wood uh, uh, of uh, Quranic Arabic in Sini script, but also with Confucian <coughs> aphorisms alongside. What on earth is it doing in a gritty little back street kebab shop? I don't know. It should be in a library or somewhere, somewhere grand, somewhere like this, for example. Uh, it's all hand carved into wood panels. Uh, so Confucian aphorisms, Quran, and Sini script. When I spoke to the owner, he said he, want, he quote, wanted to bring an atmosphere of the Northwest, there's that word again, into his restaurant. This reminded me of the restaurant in Hangzhou, where the word Northwest had been used to uh, in replace of the word Islam. This is, importantly, I had to explain to him what the Arabic meant. He had no idea. But does that matter? If, like Meili in the slide earlier, your attachment to heritage literacy is through its emblematic quality rather than its hermeneutic quality, then it doesn't really matter that you can't read it. He obviously wanted to insert his heritage literacy into his business. Of course, a display like that might be unheard of if you're in the Northwest. He's in Shanghai. Of course, it's not just about text. It's about visual stand-ins, like we saw that with the picture earlier, and the wearing of Li Bai Mao, the white hat, which means worship hat. Sometimes the ethics of Qingzhen are manifested through the wearing of the hat, or something similar. Look at the packaging of Wang Shui's brand, which has been around for a long time. I don't think there's any Qingzhen or halal labeling, but there doesn't, does there need to be? Wang is halal, he represents halalness and Muslimness with his white hat, which looks more like a fez from Egypt than a li, the regular Li Bai Mao of uh, uh, Chinese Sino-Muslims. Um, and others you see as well. Qingzhen ethics is often talked about 
uh, by participants. Xiaoming from Ningxia says, For me, the most important thing about being Hui is not to eat pork and not to wear a white hat while doing karaoke. That's really important semiotically in terms of the semiotic significance of the message you are sending out while you're wearing it. Other participants talked about the exoticization of Minzu heritage, where people put on white hats and dance on TikTok, and they didn't like it. Uh, people talk because they didn't like the exoticization of it. This is a Li Bai Mao, after all, a worship hat. Uh, and uh, so now we move on to heritage literacy in the home. It gets complicated, so I'm going to hand it over to Hung. <laughs> yeah, this is a very typical example that multiple people handle one uh, single case. So this is uh, our uh, individual participants in a study, uh, Xiaoming, who is 85 years old, while the uh, interview was carried out. And um, uh, she studied in, uh, in the mosque for 10 years in Henan province and then moved to Xi'an after uh, some kind of uh, live event and then um, <coughs> after the Cultural Revolution, apparently. And we engaged with three generations of her family in the research, namely the daughter and the granddaughter. And uh, this extract was taken from one of the books that Xiaoming used to learn jiao fa, meaning fig, the uh, practic uh, Islamic law during a period of learning in a Henan mosque. And uh, here, if you can read uh, Arabic, uh, you, will, you will see this is not Arabic. But if you cannot read Arabic, you think, uh, wow, these are Arabic letters put together. Yes, they are. But these are, we call it xiaoji, meaning you use Arabic letters to pronounce Chinese characters. And uh, uh, it is important to highlight that Xiaoming, our participant, did not <coughs> learn Arabic, nor she had learned it. The book was read out in the classic, uh, in the class, within both the mosque and the home, and um, pointing to the permeability of oral and literal modes in situated heritage literacy events. Not only does the oral and the literal binary <coughs> demolish upon uh, scrutiny, but so too does the monolingual and bilingual binaries. And also, uh, she uh, also heard Arabic read out uh, in Chinese characters allow her to pronounce the uh, Arabic prayers to improve through listening. And uh, these everyday um, lessons and discussions in her life therefore needed to be both transmodal and translingual uh, encounters in order to make sense for her. And she heard these texts read out, expanded their uh, content across modes. So speaking more to the translingual and transmodal aspects, we have a copy of this book here, by the way, you can have a look at it. This is a book that was used for lessons on aqidah, or the Islamic belief dogma. Uh, um, uh, so here we can see Chinese and Arabic used as a commentary on the points of belief to help Chi people who could not read Arabic directly or needed the Chinese, or who could only access Chinese through Arabic script. It's quite complicated, actually, uh, in the sense that it employs all of these. That's why it's repertoire-based. Um, remember what I said earlier about not respecting the boundaries of language. Uh, uh, this is, you know, quite, quite much in that same vein. Uh, this was handwritten and then became canon for that particular mosque. This is really important. Handwritten stuff becoming canonized. Uh, uh, this book is from quite early on. I believe it might be the 1930s. <coughs> Uh, so book, books like these allow us to see the fluid negotiations of language with other modes such as image, bodily movement, and sound, without which they are not fully understood. So part of the book has Chinese text with Arabic phonetic script as parallel, but not consistently throughout. Occasionally there's a direct translation, occasionally there isn't. Uh, uh, so it's really situational. You've got to know the situation. You've got to know it through social practice uh, rather than just focusing on the text. Uh, they are intrinsic to discussions and oral interaction. And this would be a, I've got a copy of this by the way here, uh, this would be a, a sort of supplementary glossary that you might use with a, a, any fiqh book. It's meant to be for a particular book, but, but you could use it for any. <coughs> it's separated according to uh, uh, 
um, the barbs or the chapters of a classical fiqh book, which you usually start with Kitab al Tahara, the Book of Purity. There comes that concept about Ching Jen again. Purity comes first. Uh, so, Ching Jen ethics is the gateway into Islamic, all Islamic forms of worship, because any Islamic worship is contingent on your purity. Uh, Arabic keyword followed by Chinese explanation followed by Semitic transliteration as Hung highlighted Xiao Qing. <clears throat> there are modern adaptations of these, of course, in modern generations as younger people sought, seek to help each other out online, teaching each other how to pray and learn about religion. Uh, so we see uh, modern adaptations of these um, uh, by, by people uh, uh, in, in the research. Um, uh, a modern sort of commitment and symbolic attachment to, to Qing as scripture, uh, though in a manner that is far removed from the Quranic Arabic of scripture hall education that many people had in the past. Um, <clears throat> earlier forms of literacy, particularly Han Jing, scriptural writ words written in Chinese characters, the opposite of Xiao Jing, okay? Chinese words written in uh, Persa Arabic script, you also got the, the reverse of that. Uh, have e some of these have either become eclipsed or co opted by modern forms of literacy, literacy practices done online. Uh, and this connects also back to the calligrapher who used certain words to avoid uh, censorship. <clears throat> the conferring, this is nearly my last slide, uh, uh, conferring of a scripture name. I thought this was interesting going back to the scripture name again. So here we have the conferring of a scripture name. Uh, Ism Mawlud Mubarak, you know, the, the, the name of the blessed newborn is Solomon or Suleiman, Solomon in, in, in biblical uh, t terminology. And his Chinese name, his regular Han Chinese is uh, Wang Mu Yuan, which it actually sounds like a pretty Islamic name actually. Mu and Yuan I think means origin. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and may Allah grant him a long life, amen, uh, by the Lord of the worlds. And there's a part that I can't read. I don't, I think, bisihatihi, maybe his good health. I don't, I can't make it out. But, <clears throat> but my point is, this is a literacy event, as we say. It's the conferring of, an, of, a, of a name, a scripture name coming from the scripture. Uh, and so that connects us back to that. Okay, so last slide. Uh, through examining everyday heritage literacy, we can see how Sino-Muslim heritage is, is expressed, constructed, and remembered through the intertwined domains of food, consumption, trade, and religion. Uh, in the examples we have s discussed today, we see a kind of <clears throat> a, a, a sort of a, um, simult they are characterized by their simultaneity and, and have to be translingual and transmodal and require a commitment to ethno ethnography or autoethnography to really understand their implications. Heritage literacies have trajectories, you have to follow them. Uh, they have re-renditions, adaptations, and they relate to historical factors. Uh, and, and so they also relate to commercial conditions, I would say, as well as these were ancient stops on the ancient Silk Road, Lanzhou, Xining, and uh, what was the other one? Xi'an, right? So, uh, and now we have sort of one belt, one road in China and multiple <coughs> new movements of people and movements of her adaptations of heritage alongside. So as a, I'll throw that in at the end now, that, that that's also a factor here. <clears throat> And so that's it really. As Sino Muslims do not have a minority language through which to ring fence and protect their heritage, we argue that their heritage literacy practices are, are all the more sociolinguistically interesting. So just thank you very much. First of all, thank you for, for being here and allowing me to, to chat with you. Um, we exchanged some, some notes about some things that we might talk about, and I think one of the things that really struck me reading the article about um, heritage that was really interesting is that you all talk in your, your article about um, sort of heritage as a verb, right? Heritage, <coughs> uh, and how it sort of connects people uh, sort of between a past, a present, and also sort of a, a future as well. And I wondered if you might talk a little bit about, you know, sort of this idea of, of heritaging and, and how it's, it's sort of coming out in this, in this uh, set of practices that people practice <coughs> every day and, and, you know, how it sort of makes these temporal links. Yeah, um, <clears throat> if I may. <clears throat> well, our commitment to the everyday and the vernacular uh, has led us to sort of 
uh, see what might be beyond the confines of, uh, um, uh, of named language like Mandarin or English or Arabic. And, our, and it's also uh, shown, highlighted to us that, um, that, that it's often beyond borders beyond one la named language or one sort of idealized notion of language or community. And, and so I think that that's the main takeaway in terms of heritaging is that it is continually going on and uh, you might find it's very organic and individualized to some extent. I mean, there's, there's at, at the everyday level, of course, yeah. Um, and so, so, so there's that element as well, really, that, 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 that is a key part of it. Um, and especially with language. Now, linguistics is never a boring enterprise because, because there are always new ways to make meaning. There are always new, new emojis come out. I'm terrible with emojis. Uh, and the WeChat ones are different to the, to the iPhone ones. Anyway, but my point is there are always new things coming out, new ways to express yourself. And how heritage is fe features in that it, it, through new ways of communicating, I think that that's the everyday heritage. I'm just using the emojis as an example, but adaptation is a continual process. Uh, and we saw with the artists that different artists, different artists uh, draw in Chinese elements in their own <coughs> understanding in different ways. Uh, uh, and it was just, so that's where the sort of like the everydayness is, 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 is the commitment to the everyday. That's where it sort of hit, uh, it comes out, I think. Yes, and uh, to myself, um, we used to learn about Jing Tang Jiao Yi, which is a scripture hall education when we were very small. But um, that, that, that kind of scripture hall education only uh, occurred during the uh, <coughs> uh, winter term, winter holiday and summer holiday. But how uh, these children um, of young people anyway, uh, they learn at home or uh, individually of within the generations. We didn't know that. That's why we carry out this um, research. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, this is an excellent sort of bridge to another thing that I want to ask about. Um, you know, in your, in your article in particular, you have these wonderful presentations of multi-generational multi conversations uh, between grandparents, parents and children, you know, ac across um, you know, three or four generations at once, talking about, you know, these ideas about how to do heritage languages mm -hmm. and, and, and engage with these things. Um, what really was really fascinating to me uh, in reading this was the notion that there were lots of different perspectives that were coming out about how one could or ought to connect to heritage. Um, and it was deeply reminiscent of conversations I remember having with people in the field uh, where everybody had a different idea of what it meant to sort of express their Muslimness or for some people, you know, their Huayness rather than their, their Muslimness. Um, I wondered if, if you uh, felt like there were similar sort of competing understandings of um, Islamic expression or Muslim expression among your participants. <laughs> was there a sense that, that people were uh, possessed an, an ideal that they had, like a, a, a <coughs> correct version? Did there, were there debates or arguments between people? Um, how, how did that kind of discussion unfold when, when you had these sort of multi-generational or multi-communal uh, uh, interviews? We didn't see any tensions and difficulties in that respect, th th though I don't doubt that they exist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we didn't see them in the research. We did see people's struggling with change and embracing change, which you, which you see with any kind of sort of multi-generational situation. Multi-generational interviews are interesting, though they are an absolute nightmare to transcribe. Because you get people that, like the grandma will say something and then the mother will say, well, what grandma's trying to say is, and then you have that ventriloquizing of what grandma said. You've got intextualization occurring in the interview itself. But anyway, that's a slightly aside there. <clears throat> but you, 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 of course, there are adaptations and how that occurred in the Sino-Muslim context. In the paper you're talking about, that was with um, the, how Xiaoming, the grandmother, had really sort of like sectioned off Muslimness in a particular sect with some practices of the family, Eid and various other things, uh, but not much else. And she, she, she saw that as part of living in a Han majority area where the uh, uh, Han intermarriages had occurred and subsequently people had not 
learnt to pray and they haven't kept up with uh, religious practice as, as much as... But she was quite, uh, how can I say, optimistic in that she felt that this was just a part of life and this was an inevitable part of changes that occur. You do see the reverse changes as well in other, in other families. But um, uh, in terms of tensions, I don't think there were any tensions in the research, but we weren't really looking at that. Linguistically, there are always tensions. They're on, they're on the shop fronts. And that's more about policy and control of linguistic landscape um, more than anything else, more than an intergenerational thing. Uh, there is another aspect here perhaps one can draw in, uh, and that is uh, the, because I know one of your questions was on the sort of umma, ummatic thinking or something. Yeah, well, yeah, was Were you going to get to that? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, right, well, we'll get to that then. <laughs> well, then in terms of tensions and things, I don't think there were that many uh, that I can see, did you? Uh, we do notice there are difference between <coughs> our participants across different parts of China. Like some <coughs> has very strict Xiaomen, which is the teaching they're following. Some are not very strict, but there's no debate ar among them. And, uh, and also uh, different people from different places disrespect to um, each other. So no debate. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that yeah, this is really fascinating. Like uh, you know, the the different aspects of <coughs> people adhere to different kinds of rules. It, again, strongly reminiscent of conversations I remember having with, with people in China. Uh, the the conversation we were talking about about the umatic, uh, I guess, element of this is uh, I think the the presentation has the image of the shop in Shanghai and you were discussing about how there was the conversation between yourself and the owner about what, what it translated to and, <laughs> and uh, there's a very similar uh, anecdote in your, your article about how uh, you know one of your interviewees goes off to learn Arabic for business and comes back and everybody in the community wants wants him to lead rituals because like oh you understand what the Arabic means yeah. and he had to say well that's not really that's not really what I'm here to do I don't have that kind of you know religious training and and there was this sort of tension about he was going to be the person to do all this interpretation um, one of the things that really I think strikes me and runs through all of this this really fascinating research are the ways in which uh, Sunni Muslims uh, connect to the global community and the ways in which they also have you know created very localized questions, <coughs> right? Um, I guess as we have moved into uh, this era of internet communication and, mm -hmm. and increased mobility and everything else, um, how does this, how do the people that you were talking to uh, think about their place within this larger community of, of faith? And, and, you know, were you seeing people who were uh, through these sort of heritage traditions of, of Arabic and, and, and uh, other types of, of use of language trying to connect to uh, the greater Islamic community and, and, and what was that like? Yes, it's an interesting question. Um, I'll start with Arabic. I, I've often f found, and I have tried to discuss this with people, but apparently nobody's written a paper on it, is that f uh, Fusha Arabic or Classical Arabic is a, is a lingua franca for Muslims, or at least uh, theologically oriented Muslims. I think it is. I've sp I mean, I don't do it that well, but I have a foundational Islamic theological education, and that allowed me to speak to that participant in the research in Fusha Arabic. Mm -hmm. It also allowed me to, I've also communicated with people in Malaysia in Arabic when I've got stuck, and in Indonesia, and in, also in China. And I once met somebody from Afghanistan, and he didn't speak Urdu, which I have some <coughs> knowledge of. And so I had to speak to him in Arabic. And I've spoken in, uh, as, with, in Arabic as a lingua franca, all people across the Arab world. So I think it's, it, it's, it's a lingua franca, but I, nobody's written on it, so maybe somebody should. Uh, but, because <clears throat> everybody writes about like English as a lingua franca, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, so that's the first thing, that Arabic is a foundational theological lingua franca. <laughs> Right? And so that, that creates a connection. So there's always this connection to Arabic. And to some extent, the artwork is still trying to, to do that. It's still maintaining this metalinguistic, in, in, in linguistic anthropology, they call it meta, a metalinguistic sort of attachment. That it's not really it's reading and writing that you do, it's you have a metalinguistic connection to Arabic. Uh, rather like many Western Jewish communities might have with Yiddish and Hebrew. Uh, so the, 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 the artwork, could, 
continues this metalinguistic connection, which then allows them to connect to the wider Muslim world. Of course, in terms of the ummah, or ummatic thinking, as some people call it, the wider global community of Muslims, I mean, that only really manifests during pilgrimage and hajj, and very few, and usually with a big issue, like Palestine or something, you'll see ummatic thinking, if you can call it that, manifesting, but it doesn't really manifest at any other time. People who talk about ummatic thinking need to sort of balance that with what I would call urfi thinking, which is, the, the word urf is part of Islamic law, it's one of the six principles of Islamic law, which means <coughs> culture and custom. It's actually one of the principles that people use to make judgments and fatwas about Islamic law. This is going way beyond linguistics now, right? But, but it plays out linguistically, because language is part of urf, it's part of the URF, sorry my throat, I'm not saying it right. It's part of, it's part of the customs of the culture, and Muslims obviously are uh, customs and culture oriented people. So Indonesians are decidedly Indonesian. They wear batik and a sarong. Chinese Muslims are very Chinese, uh, and British Muslims are very British. Uh, and so, so, so I think that there's urfi thinking, and then there's ummah or ummatic thinking. Uh, and they both got to balance each other out. Uh, and Arabic as a metalingu as a theological lingua, lingua franca, gets you into the latter camp. And I think that using Mandarin and Chinese elements puts you back into the other camp. And I think that Muslim practice uh, usually is this kind of oscillation between the two. Do you want to add anything? Uh, no. Okay. Um, so, one sort of final thought that I, I have, because I, I have so many questions that we could you know, stay up here all day and, and I would monopolize the conversation and not give our guests a, a chance to talk and that would be unfortunate. Um, but one sort of final question that comes up when you talk about uh, covert semiotics and also just in recognition in, in various places that um, there are now sort of increased regulations about where uh, practices can occur. Uh, particularly practices related to the use of Arabic and to the sort of <coughs> expression of faith. Um, and I think, you know, there are some wonderful examples both in, in the presentation and in, in the writing about how uh, coded language works and about how, especially visually, uh, some of these elements are still incorporated. I, I wonder if you got a sense um, about where the future of this sort of semiotic presentation might go if this space continues to be uh, sort of restricted or, or avenues are limited to the more sort of uh, ethnicized presentations that you see uh, as a part of the uh, policy? Uh, in China? In China. Uh, yeah, or, or elsewhere. Uh, well, I think that people will just revert, oscillate slightly more to Urfi thinking. Mm. Uh, uh, that is localized customs and culture. They will be the, the they will just sort of like uh, try to create ways of expressing uh, uh, religion more through that lens, as 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 they have. Um, for example, on this slide, you can see the Songjiang Mosque in Shanghai, Chinese calligraphy alongside, on par, on equal footing with uh, Arabic calligraphy. Uh, you find very few places in the world where you will see the local language written calligraphically alongside Arabic, any mosque in any world, city in the world. But you see a lot in China, I think that's really interesting that it's on equal. I mean, it would be nice if we had English calligraphy next to Arabic calligraphy in a mosque. Maybe that would be our like come homecoming, perhaps. <laughs> but they've done it in China, maybe with a little bit of coercion along the way. But, uh, um, but how, how do I see it playing out? Um, I don't know is the, is the answer. We'll just see more adaptations, more creative adaptations. Of course, uh, it varies from place to place. Uh, you don't have those restrictions in Shanghai, mm. but you have them in other places. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, linguistically, I mean, r religions are extremely resilient things, you know? Uh, they, Christianity under the Roman Empire, etc. So uh, uh, they're extremely resilient. And so really, uh, I'm quite optimistic about how linguistically there'll always be work to do. You know, there'll be no shortage of ideas of the things to me to research as well as to do. Yeah, I agree with him uh, because uh, we can see adaptations everywhere. <coughs> I mean, in the UK, the Muslims <coughs> adapt themselves in the local culture. Mm -hmm. And in China, it's the same. We had a uh, few participants 
uh, saying that no matter what the policy is, we just be ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, if things come to us, we adapt to it, and uh, just life is going on. <laughs> Money also plays a big role. Changing business is huge, as you write about in your book. Yes, it's huge. So that sometimes, if you don't have a heritage language, and you can't ring fence and protect your heritage through language, you've got to do it through business or intangible cultural heritage or within any of those spheres where you can get some kind of uh, legit legitimation uh, and uh, protection, as it were. Uh, so yeah. And also with but one belt, one road, and with connections around that the country has with other Muslim dominant nations and internationalization of universities with students coming from all over the Muslim world. It's just, it can't continue like that with, with all that happening. <laughs>